How do you build a brand new, cutting edge dreadnought battleship and get its main feature so fundamentally wrong? Japan managed it with the Kawachi class, and for one of the sister ships, the mistake would be the least of its problems. This is the story of a flawed giant, a vessel born from ambition that was destined for tragedy, and its twin sister, a ship that simply refused to die. In the early 1900s, the world's oceans were a chessboard for global powers, and the most powerful piece was the battleship. The turn of the century had been good to Japan. In 1905, the Imperial Japanese Navy had annihilated the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima, a victory so decisive it sent shockwaves across the globe and instantly established Japan as a premier naval power. But technology, as always, was moving faster than anyone could have predicted. Just one year after Tsushima, Great Britain launched a vessel that changed everything. HMS Dreadnought. With its all-big gun armament and steam turbine propulsion, it rendered every single battleship that came before it, including Japan's victorious fleet, utterly obsolete. The Dreadnought shock was real, and the race was on. For the admirals in Tokyo, the message was clear. Adapt or be left behind. The nation's pride and its strategic security demanded a fleet of these new, powerful behemoths. This led to the ambitious 8-8 fleet program, a grand strategic plan calling for a core force of eight modern dreadnought battleships and eight battlecruisers, a fleet that could theoretically challenge any navy on Earth. The very first ships authorized under this ambitious new doctrine, the first true dreadnoughts to be laid down for the Imperial Japanese Navy, were the two ships of the Kawachi class, the lead ship, Kawachi, and her sister, Setsu. They were to be the dawn of a new era, symbols of Japan's industrial might and naval prowess, intended to carry the rising sun flag into the new century. There was just one rather significant problem. The design of the Kawachi class was a product of its time, a transitional period between old ideas and radical new ones, Japanese naval architects looked to the world for inspiration. While they revered their allies in Great Britain, for the main gun layout they borrowed heavily from the contemporary German Nassau-class battleships. This resulted in a hexagonal arrangement for the six main turrets. Two were placed on the center line, one forward and one aft. The other four were mounted in pairs on the wings of the ship, two on the port side and two on the starboard, staggered to maximize their firing arcs. In total, the ships carried a dozen powerful 12-inch or 305 millimeter guns. On paper, this was a formidable arsenal. In practice, however, this layout meant that no matter which way the ship turned, it could only ever bring a maximum of eight of its 12 main guns to bear on a single target during a broadside. It wasn't ideal, but it was a common enough compromise at the time. The real flaw, the truly baffling decision, was hidden inside those guns themselves. This was the critical, almost unbelievable error that crippled the Kawachi class from the moment it was conceived. The main guns were not identical. The two centerline turrets, fore and aft, were equipped with the latest 12-inch 50 caliber Mark II guns. These were long, powerful weapons. The four wing turrets, however, were fitted with older 12-inch 45 caliber Mark I guns. This meant the barrels of the wing guns were shorter than those on the centerline. The reason for this bizarre mismatch came down to two simple factors, time and money. The longer 50 caliber guns were still in the design phase when the battleships were being laid down, and there were concerns they wouldn't be ready in time. More importantly, the Japanese Navy already had a stockpile of the shorter 45 caliber guns and the machinery to build more, making them a cheaper and more readily available option. So a compromise was made. But this wasn't like choosing a different brand of paint. This was a fundamental error that defied the entire principle of modern naval gunnery. The whole point of an all big gun ship like a dreadnought was to fire all its guns together at a distant target, creating a single massive splash pattern that could be walked onto an enemy vessel by a central fire control director. But longer gun barrels fire a shell at a higher velocity than shorter ones. This means that even with the exact same charge, the shells from the Kawachi's 50 caliber guns would travel further 
and on a different trajectory than the shells from its 45 caliber guns. The unified fire control solution for a long-range broadside was therefore physically impossible. The ship was designed in such a way that it could not aim all of its main guns at the same spot at the same time. It was a remarkable achievement in self-sabotage, a battleship built with a split personality. Beyond this glaring issue, the rest of the ship was a fairly standard design for the period. Protection was provided by a main armored belt of Krupp cemented steel that was 12 inches thick amidships, tapering to 5 inches at the ends. The deck armor was much thinner, at just over 1 inch, a common vulnerability in early dreadnoughts designed before the threat of long-range plunging fire was fully appreciated. Power came from 16 Miyabara water tube boilers feeding two Curtis steam turbines, a major step up from the reciprocating engines of older ships. This power plant produced 25,000 shaft horsepower, driving the 22,000-ton vessel to a respectable top speed of about 20 knots, or 37 kilometers per hour. For close-in defense against smaller, faster vessels like destroyers and torpedo boats, the sisters carried a heavy secondary armament of 10 6-inch, 152mm guns and 8 4.7-inch, 120mm guns, supplemented by a dozen smaller 12-pounders. They were also fitted with five submerged 18-inch, 457mm torpedo tubes, a feature that was standard at the time, but would prove to be of little practical use. The Kawachi was laid down at the Yokosuka Naval Arsenal in April 1909, and her sister, the Setsu, followed at the Kure Naval Arsenal in January 1909. There was immense national pride as these steel giants took shape, the largest and most powerful warships ever built in Japan. Kawachi was commissioned into the Imperial Japanese Navy in March 1912, with Setsu following two months later. They officially joined the 1st Battleship Squadron, taking their place at the forefront of the nation's defense. For the first couple of years, their service was routine, fleet exercises, training maneuvers, and showing the flag. They were potent symbols of a modernizing nation. Their crippling design flaw remained a technical detail, a problem lurking beneath the surface, yet to be exposed by the crucible of battle. When war finally did come, it would prove to be a surprisingly quiet affair for Japan's premier battleships. When World War I erupted in Europe in August 1914, Japan, honoring its alliance with Great Britain, declared war on the German Empire. Germany's primary naval and colonial base in the Far East was the port of Tsingtao in China. An Anglo-Japanese force was quickly assembled to capture it. The Setsu, as flagship of the 1st Squadron, and later the Kawachi, were dispatched as part of the blockading and siege fleet. This would be the only significant combat deployment of their careers. From October to November 1914, the battleships used their powerful guns to bombard the German forts and defensive positions around the port. The engagement was a world away from the titanic fleet actions imagined by naval theorists. They were shelling stationary land targets at relatively close ranges. Under these conditions, the mismatched guns weren't a fatal handicap, as individual turrets or pairs of turrets could be ranged on targets independently. The German garrison surrendered on November 7th, and the battleships returned to their home base at Kure. For the remainder of the long war, the Kawachi and Setsu saw no further action, spending their time on quiet, uneventful patrols in Japanese home waters, a powerful but untested force in a distant theater of the global conflict. But for the Kawachi, the greatest danger was not an enemy shell, but something far more insidious, lurking deep within her own hull. The evening of July 12, 1918, was still and warm. The Great War was finally winding down, and the IJN Kawachi was moored peacefully at anchor in Tokuyama Bay, on the western coast of Japan. The day's routines were complete. Most of the crew were below decks, preparing for the night. At approximately 3.51 in the afternoon, a loud rumbling sound was heard from the forward part of the ship. Seconds later, a massive explosion erupted. A thick column of smoke and fire blasted through the deck between the forward superstructure and the number one turret. The blast was so powerful, it ripped the battleship's hull open to the sea. The ship immediately lurched heavily to starboard. Water flooded into the breached compartments with unstoppable force. 
the order to abandon ship was likely never heard by most. Within just four minutes of the initial explosion, the mighty dreadnought rolled over completely, capsized, and sank bow first into the murky waters of the bay. It was a catastrophe of shocking speed and violence. Of the approximately 1,100 men on board, over 600 went down with the ship, trapped within the steel tomb as it plunged to the seabed. Some sources place the death toll even higher, over 700 souls. The Imperial Japanese Navy was stunned. A commission of inquiry was immediately convened to determine the cause of the disaster. Sabotage was initially suspected, but no evidence could be found. The investigation quickly focused on the ship's ammunition. The culprit was identified as the cordite propellant used for the main guns. Cordite, a type of smokeless powder, was notoriously unstable. Over time, it could degrade and decompose, becoming highly volatile and prone to spontaneous ignition, especially in the hot, poorly ventilated conditions of a warship's magazine. The commission concluded that the cordite in Kawachi's forward magazine had degraded and self-detonated, causing the disaster. Japan was not alone in this tragedy. Several other navies, including Britain's Royal Navy, which lost vessels like HMS Vanguard and HMS Natal to the exact same cause, had learned the hard lesson of unstable propellant. The wreck of the Kawachi was deemed a hazard to navigation, and salvage operations were carried out to clear the channel, but the majority of the hull and the remains of her crew were left on the seafloor, a permanent tragic memorial. While Kawachi met a sudden and fiery end, her sister ship Setsu, was destined for a very different and much longer path. She survived the war, but her days as a frontline battleship were numbered. In 1922, the world's major naval powers met in Washington, D.C. to sign a treaty aimed at preventing a costly and destabilizing post-war naval arms race. The Washington Naval Treaty placed strict limits on the number and tonnage of capital ships each nation could possess. Dozens of older battleships and battlecruisers, as well as new ones still under construction, were ordered to be scrapped or demilitarized. The Kawachi class, with their flawed design and relatively slow speed, were prime candidates for removal. Under the terms of the treaty, the Setsu had to be disarmed. In 1924, the transformation began. Her 12 massive 12-inch guns were removed. Some of these were later installed in coastal artillery batteries around the Japanese coast, destined to see one last fight in 1945. All of her secondary guns and torpedo tubes were also taken out, and a significant portion of her side armor was stripped away. Her role as a vessel of combat was over. Her new job was to be a target. For the next decade, the Setsu served the fleet as a non-roving target ship, absorbing punishment from the new generation of Japanese cruisers and destroyers during gunnery exercises, her heavily reinforced hull proving remarkably resilient. But her most interesting transformation was yet to come. In the mid-1930s, as Japan's military ambitions grew and it prepared to abandon the naval treaties, the Setsu was taken in hand for a major refit she was converted into a radio-controlled target vessel. Her boilers were replaced, and new funnels were fitted, one of which was a dummy to disguise her identity. Sophisticated radio equipment was installed that allowed a crew on a nearby destroyer to remotely control her engines and rudder, making her a much more realistic and challenging target for naval aviators practicing their bombing and torpedo runs. Her most crucial and clandestine role, however, came in late 1941, as Admiral Nagumo's carrier strike force, the Kido Butai, maintained strict radio silence and began its secret transit across the Pacific towards Pearl Harbor, the IJN needed a way to deceive Allied intelligence. They needed to make it seem as though the carriers were still in Japanese home waters, conducting routine exercises. The old, disarmed battleship Setsu was chosen for the job. She steamed around the southern islands of Japan, generating a high volume of false radio traffic that mimicked the signals of the entire carrier fleet. Allied radio intelligence picked up the signals, just as intended, and reported that the carriers were still at home. The deception worked perfectly, contributing in its own small way to the total surprise achieved at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Throughout World War II, the Setsu continued her thankless job as a training and target ship. She steamed thousands of miles, dodging practice bombs and torpedoes dropped by pilots 
who would go on to fight at the Coral Sea, Midway, and Guadalcanal. She was a floating whetstone, used to sharpen the sword of the Imperial Japanese Navy. By 1945, however, with the Navy all but annihilated and American air power dominating the skies over Japan, there was nowhere left for any ship to hide. On July 24, 1945, while moored at the Great Naval Base of Kure, the Setsu came under attack from aircraft of the U.S. Navy's Task Force 38. She was hit by bombs and strafed repeatedly. Heavily damaged and taking on water, she was intentionally beached in shallow water by her skeleton crew to prevent her from sinking and blocking the harbor. Just four days later, the battered hulk was attacked again and suffered at least two more direct bomb hits. This time, the damage was fatal. The old ship, which had survived treaties, shell fire, and decades of abuse, finally settled on the bottom for good. After the war, her wreck was refloated one last time between 1946 and 1947, and the steel from Japan's first dreadnought class was unceremoniously broken up for scrap. The legacy of the Kawachi class is a strange one. On one hand, they were a failure. Born with a critical design flaw that made them ineffective as long-range fighting ships, they represented a misstep on the path of naval evolution. One sister, the Kawachi, provided a tragic and brutal lesson in the importance of ammunition stability, a lesson learned by many navies of the era at a terrible human cost. But then there is the Setsu, a ship that was, by all accounts, a second-rate battleship from the day she was launched. Yet she went on to serve the navy that built her for over 30 years in a multitude of roles. She trained the gunners and pilots for a war she could never fight. She played a key role in one of the most audacious deceptions in military history. And she absorbed countless blows, refusing to surrender until the very bitter end. The story of the Kawachi and Setsu is a perfect snapshot of a navy in transition full of ambition, learning hard lessons, and adapting its assets in strange and unexpected ways. They were the flawed pioneers, the first imperfect step on Japan's long and ultimately doomed quest for naval supremacy. We've delved into the tragic flaws of this battleship, but now we want to hear from you. What piece of military history, legendary machine, or untold story do you think is crying out for a deep dive? Drop your mission briefing in the comments below because your suggestions help steer the course of this channel. We read every single one, and your idea might just be our next target. If you've enjoyed this journey into the stranger corners of naval history and want to be sure you catch the next investigation, make sure you are subscribed and have sounded the notification alarm. It's the only way to guarantee you won't miss out when we deploy our next story.